Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. The test is in 4 part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and a shop assistant. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning, Jenny Suit Rental. Jenny speaking. How may I be of service? Hi there. My name is Max Jones. That's J-O-N-E-S. And I'm looking to rent a suit out for a special occasion. Certainly, Max. We charge a set fee for our services. You can either choose from our designer range and pay £50 to rent your suit out, or choose from our standard range at a cost of £25. So, what will it be? Oh, the first option please, Jenny. Uh, £25, did you say? Unfortunately not. The designer range is twice that price. Oh, in that case I'll take the second option. Uh, standard, was that it? That's right. Now, before we go any further, may I ask how you intend to pay? Do you accept cheques? Yes, but only in exceptional circumstances. We prefer cash or credit card. Well, as I haven't got one, does this count as uh, those circumstances? Yes, that'll be fine. Make it payable to Jenny's Suit Rental. Will do. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now Max, can I take your measurements please and a few details about what sort of suit you have in mind? Certainly. Let's start with the trousers then, shall we? What is your waist size and leg length? I used to be 32 waist, you know, but these days it's more like 36. Too many cream pies. I've been there. And about the leg, 34? I wish. I'm afraid I'm somewhat lacking in the height department. Not even a 32. 30, I'm afraid. Never mind. As for the colour, could you do a dark grey suit? In fact, we have a very smart one of those in just your size. You're in luck. Now, what about shoes? Same colour? No, I think I prefer something darker. OK, let's go with traditional black then, shall we? What about size? Uh, I'm a size 45. Hmm... By my calculations, that's uh, 10 in our sizes. And style? What have you got? We do suede, nubuck and traditional leather. Definitely the last one. Very well. And will you be wanting a necktie? Do you do bow ties? Of course. I'll put one of those down in your order. Dark grey, I presume? Perfect. To match the suit. I think I fancy a light blue shirt, by the way. Might I recommend a green? Green would go very well with the suit you are renting. Light or dark? I'd say dark. Dark it is then. My next size is 17 and a half. Uh, hard to believe that a little over a year ago I could fit into a 15, isn't it? Those cream pies again, right? You got it. Now, what about your suit jacket? Same colour as the trousers, obviously, but what size? Medium should be fine. You sure? Yeah. And have you got any of those three-button ones? I'm afraid not. The one and two-button suit jackets are far more popular at the moment. In fact, the one button is all the rage. Let's have that one, then. No problem. Now. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of an interview between Dr. Hilsden, a member of staff on a fashion design course, and a student, Julia, who is applying to do the course. First, look at questions eleven to thirteen. Right, Julia. So, from your CV and portfolio, and what you've already told me, you seem to be very much the sort of person we're looking for on the postgraduate course. So, tell me, you finished your fashion design course in London four years ago. Did you think of carrying straight on and doing a higher degree at the time? Yes, but there were financial pressures, so I ended up working in the retail industry, as you can see from my CV.、Mm -hmm. And actually, it was a very useful experience.、Hmm. In what way? Well, I was lucky to get the job with Fashion Now. They're a big store, and one of my priorities was to get as much experience as possible in different areas. So that was good because I had the chance to work in lots of different departments. And having direct contact with the customers meant I was able to see how they reacted to innovation,、uh, to new fashion ideas. Because with fashion now, a designer might show something in New York or Milan, and there'll be something similar in the shop within weeks. So that was probably the most useful thing for me. Right. And so, what's made you decide to do a postgraduate course now? Um, well, while I enjoyed working at Fashion Now and I learned a lot there, I felt well. The way forward would have been to develop my managerial skills rather than my skills in fashion design, and I'm not sure that's what I want to do.、Mm, yes. When I was doing my degree in London, I'd been interested in women's wear, but I know that there's been a lot of work done in areas like new fabric construction. And though I'm not intending to go too deeply into the technology, I'd be very interested in looking at how new fabrics could be used in children's wear. So I'd like the chance to pursue that line. Yes, good. And are you at all concerned about what it's going to be like coming back into an academic context after being away from it for several years? No, I'm looking forward to it.、Huh. But I'm basically more interested in the application than the theory. Or at least that's what I've found so far, and I'm hoping the course will give me the contacts and skills I need eventually to set up my own enterprise. I'm particularly interested by the overseas links that the department has. Yes, many of our students look overseas or to international companies for sponsorship of their projects. Before the talk continues, look at questions fourteen to twenty. As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. And the facilities here look excellent. I just went to look at the library. It's really impressive. There's so much room compared with the one at my old university. Yes, most students find it's a good place to study,、mm. and there are link-ups to other universities, of course, and all the usual electronic sources. The staff run an information skills program, which we recommend all postgraduates do in the first week or two. Design students find these special collections particularly useful. Yes. Then we have a separate computer centre, which has its own academic coordinator, Tim Spender. He's got a background in art design, and the ethos of the centre is that it's a studio for innovation and creativity, rather than a computer laboratory. Oh right. 
I liked the study spaces where students can sit and discuss work together. Very useful for joint projects. We always had to do that sort of thing in the cafeteria when I was an undergraduate. <laughs> and I read in the brochure that there's a separate resource for photography. Yes, it's called Photo Media. It's not just for photography, but things like digital imaging and new media. It's a resource for all our students, not just fashion design. And we encourage students to work there, producing work that crosses disciplinary boundaries. It's well used. In fact, it's doubled in size since it was set up three years ago. And we also have an offshoot from that, which is called time-based media. This is for students who want to develop their ideas in the area of the moving image or sound. That's in a new building that was specially built for it just last year. But there are plans to expand it, as the present facilities are overstretched already. Right. Now, uh, is there anything you'd like to ask about the course itself? Um, I know it's a combination of taught modules and a specialist project, mm -hmm. but how does assessment fit in? Well, uh, as you'd expect on a course of this nature, it's an ongoing process. The degree course has four stages, and there are what we call progress reviews at the end of each of the first three. Then the final assessment is based on your project. You have to produce a report which is a critical reflection on your work. And is there some sort of fashion show? There's an exhibition. The projects aren't all focused on clothes as such. Some are more experimental, so that seems more appropriate. We ask representatives of fashion companies along, and it's usually well attended. Right. And another thing I wanted to ask. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear an extract from a talk about the congestion charging scheme. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. For more practical details, I'll pass you over to John Ward from the London Tourist Agency. Thanks. So that was a brief introduction to the congestion charging scheme. But if you're actually going to be driving your car in London on weekdays, there are a few more details you will need to know. Firstly, you don't need to worry about paying all the time. The charge applies between 7 in the morning and half past six in the evening, Monday to Friday. You'll be pleased to hear, however, that because the scheme is intended to reduce traffic during busy working hours, evenings and weekends are free. If you enter the zone during the charging times, you'll be eligible to pay the standard charge of £8, which you can pay until 10 o'clock on that day. After 10 o'clock, this charge rises to £10. But be warned, if you fail to pay before midnight, you will have to pay an automatic penalty charge. In other words, there's no escape. Let's move on to paying. The charge, as I've said, is £8 a day, and the authorities have set up a number of systems to make it easy for you to pay, or rather to ensure that nobody has a good excuse for not paying. So, using your credit card, you can pay by phone, by text message, or on the internet. The other option is to go to one of the 200 pay points inside the zone, or the 9,500 pay points elsewhere in the country. If you know you're going to be driving in and out of London on a regular basis, you can buy weekly, monthly or annual passes, rather like a railway season ticket.
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK, on to the area itself. The congestion charging zone is everywhere inside London's inner ring road. For those of you not familiar with London's road system, this includes the City of London, that's the main financial district, and the West End, the commercial and entertainment centre. If you're still not sure, there are very clear signs on all roads which indicate when you are entering the area. These are round and have a white letter C on a red background. The scheme is policed by cameras which photograph all cars entering the area and send them to a computer which can recognise all British and European car registration plates. If you pay the £8 charge, you'll find London a little easier to drive round than it was before the charge was introduced. But if it's all too much trouble and you decide to leave your car at home, then you are left with public transport. That's trains, buses, taxis or the underground. Some of the money from the congestion charging scheme is being used to upgrade public transport, so you should see improvements there. And because of reductions in the number of private vehicles on London's roads brought about by congestion charging, buses and taxis are providing a quicker, more efficient service than they did in the past. OK. I've covered the main details that you need to know. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a speaker giving a talk about some recent research about unusual life forms. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everybody and welcome to the sixth of our ecology evening classes. Nice to see you all again. As you know from the program, today I want to talk to you about some research that is pushing back the frontiers of the whole field of ecology. And this research is being carried out in the remoter regions of our planet, places where the environment is harsh and, until recently, it was thought that the conditions couldn't sustain life of any kind. But life forms are being found, and these have been grouped into what is now known as extremophiles. That is, organisms that can survive in the most extreme environments. And these discoveries may be setting a huge challenge for the scientists of the future, as you'll see in a minute. Now, the particular research I want to tell you about was carried out in Antarctica, one of the coldest and driest places on Earth. But a multinational team of researchers from the US, Canada and New Zealand recently discovered 
colonies of microbes in the soil there where no one thought it was possible. Interestingly enough, some of the colonies were identified as a type of fungus called Buviria bassiana, a fungus that lives on insects. But where are the insects in these utterly empty regions of Antarctica? The researchers concluded that this was clear evidence that these colonies were certainly not new arrivals. They might have been there for centuries, or even millennia. Possibly even since the last ice age. Can you imagine their excitement? Now, some types of microbes had previously been found living just a few millimetres under the surface of rocks. Porous, Antarctic rocks. But this was the first time that living colonies had been found surviving um, relatively deeply in the soil itself, several centimetres down, in fact. So, the big question is, how can these colonies survive there? Well, we know that the organisms living very near the rock's surface can still be warmed by the sun, so they can survive in their own microclimate. And this keeps them from freezing during the day. But this isn't the case for the colonies that are hidden under the soil. In their research paper, this team suggested that the very high amounts of salt in the soil might be the clue because this is what is preventing essential water from freezing. The team found that the salt concentration increased the deeper down they went in the soil. But while they had expected the number of organisms to be fewer down there, they actually found the opposite. In soil that had as much as 3,000 parts of salt per million, relatively high numbers of microbes were present, which seems incredible. But the point is that at those levels of salt, the temperature could drop to minus 56 degrees before frost would cause any damage to the organisms. This relationship between microbes and salt, at temperatures way below the normal freezing point of water, is a really significant breakthrough. As you all know, life is dependent on the availability of water in liquid form, and the role of salt at very low temperatures could be the key to survival in these kinds of conditions. Now, the process at work here is called supercooling, and that's usually written as one word, but it isn't really understood as yet, so there's a lot more for researchers to work on. However, the fact that this process occurs naturally in Antarctica may suggest that it might occur in other places with similar conditions including on our neighbouring planet, Mars. So, you can start to see the wider implications of this kind of research. In short, it appears to support the growing belief that extraterrestrial life might be able to survive the dry, cold conditions on other planets after all. Not only does this research produce evidence that life is possible there, it's also informing scientists of the locations where it might be found. So all of this might have great significance for future unmanned space missions. One specialist on Mars confirms the importance of the... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.